What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, the 8th title in the Yakuza series. This one taking place in both Hawaii and Japan as we engage in turn-based battles against a sinister plot in the background. But before we dive fully into this, some things I need to get out of the way. For starters, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that includes the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. There's a video linked in the description below that covers everything I go over, my Steam profile is public and linked below as well, and as far as the achievements go, there's only one notable thing I want to mention, and that is mostly Steam specific. This game launched with a day one DLC that brought a bunch of achievements with it, including a new game plus mode, which we'll get into. But the base game has an achievement called Infinite Wealth for obtaining all the achievements, and that is separated from the DLC achievements on Steam specifically, meaning that you can get that achievement before you have the DLC ones, which I'm mostly just mentioning for people who happen to check out my Steam profile, as that is not normally how it works on Steam, though it's my understanding that for PlayStation, it's pretty normal. Otherwise, I would say the achievement cover about 90% of the base game in some form or another, meaning that the achievements are fairly representative of everything there is to do. That said, last thing I need to mention before we dive fully into this is that I did previously do a sponsored video for this title, and obviously this review isn't sponsored, nor would a review for any game I do ever be, but I think it's important to mention that I did work with Sega, the publisher, to make a sponsored video for this game. And while that sponsorship provided me access to a key for the the base game, I did actually have to purchase the New Game Plus DLC on my own, as that was not included with the key they gave me, and given that I made a subsequent video explaining how much I disliked that DLC for reasons we'll get into, I think all of that is important to mention. Now, with no further ado, let's actually dive into the bulk of this video, starting with an overview of what this game is. Now, if you are familiar with the previous entry in the Yakuza series, you'll probably be well at home here, because it took the game in a more turn-based direction, while maintaining what I would consider a very traditional JRPG format in a lot of other ways, but it takes those elements and it blends them with, I would say, a hint of realism by taking place in modern-day Hawaii and Japan, albeit with fictional events, of course. In fact, most of the fantastical things you see are simply our main character's imagination at work, transforming street thugs and things into various demons and more bizarre creations, and I think this game's blending of the mundane everyday with more, again, just very bizarre elements creates an experience that's almost like like a fever dream, and once I started playing it, I just couldn't quite bring myself to put it down. And that's a feeling that I maintained throughout the entirety of the base game, and then once you get to the New Game Plus DLC content, I think it kind of falls apart a little bit. So with no further ado, let's dive into the story side of things. Now, we play as a set character, though technically two later in the game, which is Ichiban Kasuga and Kazuma Kiryu. Now, if you're familiar with the Yakuza series, you'll know both of these characters, though realistically, this is a long series, so if you happen to be wondering, you don't need to have played any of the previous games to get a good feel for this one, though some experience with the previous title, the seventh entry, would help you out quite a bit, as there are certainly characters that get introduced that the game seems to think you would know already because your main characters do. That said, in basically every other way, the game does a good job of catching you up on who all of these characters are, and will give you the option to get that background if necessary, so you definitely don't need to have played the many previous entries to understand what's happening here. With that in mind, before the events of this game, the Yakuza, or the bulk of it, was dissolved known as the Great Dissolution, which led to its previous members kind of having to find work in the regular everyday world, which cuts to Kasuga, our main character who is getting by the best he can, helping other ex-Yakuza members find work and an honest living, really. However, his past catches up with him pretty quick in the first five hours or so of the game and puts us in contact with several other ex-Yakuza members, and it's through this that we find out that our main character's mother should be in Hawaii and our character would never naturally like to go meet her, as he was an orphan who never knew her. On our way there, it quickly becomes apparent that there is some much larger conspiracy involved, which leads to the events of the rest of the game, and obviously I'm not going to spoil that, 
but there are a few notes I want to mention. Now, while I would say Kasuga is definitely the main character, it is a bit split between him and Kiryu, especially the later chapters where Kiryu will take place in Japan while Kasuga handles everything in Hawaii. This means that these characters have a split party and a few varying mechanics. Now, in the post game, you'll freely be able to switch back and forth, so nothing is really missable in that way if that's a concern of yours. I also think the overall writing is really well done. The beginning of the game, however, is incredibly slow and honestly kind of boring. It took about five hours or so for this game to really get its hooks in me, as the first couple chapters are just explanations and plot setups, and honestly, you'll probably be watching more cutscene than playing any real game. After that, mostly once you get to Hawaii really, things start to pick up and become much more fun as you can explore a little bit more freely with a lot of the mechanics in place. But that beginning of it is really just a drip feed of information and mechanics that I think honestly could have been sped up a little bit, but realistically what they're doing there is setting up a ton of plot points that then pay off much later in the game. And given that my first run of the story took me about 70 hours, it's a significant journey on the way there, and I think a lot of that pays off, and the main story story writing in particular is very well done. I think there are multiple characters with some really fantastic arcs that take them from being people you'll likely despise at the beginning only to turn around and have a much brighter opinion of towards the end, and I think they handled that part of it exceptionally well. And the contrast between the very serious tone of the main story versus, I would say, the more ridiculous nature of a lot of the game's side content really creates this feeling of just a fever dream for me of what this game is, which makes it an incredibly unique title. So broad strokes, I enjoyed the story a lot. It starts off very slow. All of it pays off in the end. I thought the ending was great. And I think they do a great job of letting you explore everything you might have missed on the way to that ending in the post game. It falls apart a little bit after that when we start talking about New Game Plus but we'll save that for the DLC section. Because next, I want to talk about progression a little bit. There are various forms of progression in this game, but most of it comes down to your levels, your jobs, gear, and personality, and a little bit with the side quests. Now, levels is pretty straightforward. As we engage in turn-based combat, we're going to be gaining experience afterwards, and thus leveling up as we go. The higher your base level, the stronger your character is going to become in a much more drastic way. In fact, I would say your main character level matters more than just about anything else when it comes to progression, including gear. But that is also important. Then we have our job and our job ranks. Every character has a default job. This is essentially their class. This is going to decide what skills and things are available to them, and as you level up your job, which also gets experience upon every battle, you'll earn new skills and abilities for that job. However, in addition to that, you also gain permanent stat bonuses as these level up as well, which is important because you can swap them out. So while these stat bonuses are relatively minor, in aggregate they can be very impactful, especially once you get to the late game and it's easy to level these up very, very quickly. For instance, once you get to the legendary version of New Game Plus, you can level a job up from 0 to 30, which is its full skill and ability range, even though you can continue to rank it up after that, which will give you a bunch of stats and a bunch of abilities just right away. So it's really easy to quickly level them up to their sort of soft cap and get a bunch of stats for doing so. Now, as you level your personality up, it's possible to inherit skills from one job into another, allowing you to sort of mix and match a tiny amount. And you can earn more jobs through various activities, such as the Sujimancer job is unlocked through the Sujimon minigame, and many others are unlocked by going on tours of Hawaii, and even more still are unlocked simply by progressing the story and gaining certain characters. Now, not every character can take on every job. There are some limitations, but usually each character will have at least five or six options, if not more. So there's a lot to do there. Then we have our personality, which I've mentioned. This is a little bit different for Kasuga, and Kiryu individually. Kasuga has several personality stats he needs to raise, as he's the person we play the most as. And raising each of these gives you access to more and more content, and also increases your resistances to certain things in combat. Basically, the higher you get these stats, the better. There are a variety of challenges that will earn you specific experience points for each one, as well as conversation options throughout the game, or simply bonding with your companions can help you raise these. There's a lot of ways to max them out, and they go from 1 to 10. 
certain jobs are even gated behind a minimum personality stat, usually of five, and certain personality stats can give you increased resistances to certain status effects in combat for Kasuga anyway, or for his default hero job, they can even increase the effectiveness of some of his abilities. But a fair bit of content is gated behind the personality, so it's important to know how that works and how to raise it. Now for Kiryu, it's a bit different with his awakening level. You see, Kiryu is kind of the opposite of Kasuga, who's so kind of actively in his prime doing things, Kiryu is reaching the end of his life, let's say. Even in the marketing, it was explained that he has cancer and he's fighting it off, so that's a very basic plot point, to be clear. But his personality is all about walking down memory lane, so to speak, and awakening the Dragon of Dojima, as he was once known. Though functionally, it works the same way. It's just a little more condensed. And then we have side quests. I want to mention these just a tiny bit here in progression, because some side quests, like Dondoko Island or Suju and things like that can actually give you skills and stuff as you do them, or they can unlock summons for your combat ability that allows you to do that, etc. So I wouldn't consider side quests to be a major form of progression, but there is some progression tied to completing side quests, so I think it's important. But then we have gear. Every character, of course, has a weapon which is dependent upon their job, hat, body, and feet slots for their gear, which is a little bit dependent on their job for max level equipment, and then to accessories they can equip. Everything besides accessories works off a 1 to 7 star rating, and this does not continue into New Game Plus. 7 star equipment is the best you can get, and is usually class specific stuff. Now most of this, because of that star system, is fairly straightforward. It's either better or it isn't. The one thing I want to mention is getting the best weapons in the game. You see, another form of progression in this game is bonds with all of your companions, and as you fight with them in combat, walk around the area and have conversations with them about specific things called walk and talks. You can increase that bond, and doing so will allow you to get special cutscenes called drink links that then make them more effective in combat, such as chaining their attacks with yours just passively. But at the end of all of those cutscenes that said, when you see them all, you'll get a weapon for that character that is a five star weapon. You take that five star weapon and combine it with some materials that you'll find in the specific dungeons for the game. There's one in Hawaii and Japan and one is part of the New Game Plus DLC, you can take materials from those dungeons and then the weapon from the special companion cutscenes and you can craft them into a 7-star weapon for that character's default job, which is honestly pretty easy to do. So getting the best weaponry possible really isn't that much of a challenge. It's just a little bit of a grind. Which brings me to crafting. Now, this is mostly for weapons, but it is possible to craft and upgrade weaponry, most of which involves finding a base weapon out in the world and and then bringing it back to our crafting vendor who can then upgrade it with various elemental effects or into the ultimate form of said weapon. This does require you to upgrade your crafting up to a tier 4, but then it's possible to upgrade those weapons farther to a plus 50 modifier, which is just going to increase their base stats. Upgrading that to a plus 50 is going to allow you to add brands to your weapon. These are effectively enchantments that can increase various aspects of them, usually increasing the type of damage they deal in some form increasing your crit chance, etc. I found that crafting was most impactful towards the end game rather than during the story, and this is mostly because you're going to be upgrading weapons and things as you go, so I didn't really find it necessary to upgrade weapons that I was just going to throw away later, and the game seems to acknowledge this on the progression curve as well, so mostly a late game thing in my opinion, but definitely worth noting. Now, all of those progression systems combined that we just discussed and went over, I think combined to make you feel like you're always progressing something, even by just playing the game naturally. You'll be finding gear, upgrading things, you can go craft things, your personality stats will be increasing, etc, etc. So the nice thing about this game is that no matter what you're doing, it does kind of always feel like you're making progress towards some goal, and I enjoyed that quite a bit, because even just side questing is going to give you good progression rewards which makes for a really great feedback loop on the rest of the game and that content, which naturally brings us to the gameplay and world. As I mentioned, it is tied between Hawaii and Japan. Most of the time you will be in Hawaii, but in the later chapters of the game you'll be playing in Japan a bit, and then in the post game you can freely switch back and forth, which involves switching between Kasuga and Kiryu. 
Now, in the post game, you'll be able to bring any companion you want with you, whereas in the base game, you will have specific companions available in each area. And while most of the story involves going and doing specific mission based, I would say, content, the actual open world area is going to see you running around, getting in street fights, playing mini games, bonding with your companions, and just taking on all sorts of bizarre activities. Now, when it comes to fighting, you'll be able to see groups of street thugs usually with marks above their head that indicate their general power level compared to you. Blue means you can kill them instantly with a button prompt at the start of combat called a smackdown. Red means they are somewhat level appropriate, though sometimes this can be a little off. And then purple means they are well above your level and you probably shouldn't try it. There are also special enemies that are essentially mini bosses that you can see with a crown above their head sometimes. But in addition to just fights you can get into, there's also tons of stuff to find and explore. Not the least of which is meals. You can go to various restaurants, partake in what they've got, which can give you all sorts of stat buffs to run around with, but also give you an opportunity to bond further with your companions, which is also true of the many, many games. And we're going to discuss some of the more, I would say, involved ones here shortly. But you can also go and find various shops, which naturally include ways to upgrade your gear, but you can also grab gifts and things for your companions. You can engage in, I would say, more touristy attractions, such as buying souvenirs for you or your companions, finding subquests or side stories to involve yourself in, which can be anything from a weird dating simulator that is mostly there for the laughs, all the way down to a crazy taxi minigame called Crazy Eats that sees us delivering food while performing various tricks to upgrade a multiplier. There's a weird photo minigame that involves taking pictures of, let's say, more bizarre individuals. But in addition to that, in Hawaii, for instance, we have a sort of friend system with the locals where you can greet and introduce yourself to all sorts of people, such as shop vendors, etc., and help them out simply by saying hi, or in the case of vendors, buying things from them can increase your friendship level, which will give you personality stats, and the more of these that you complete, you can earn extra rewards that are pretty cool, which gives you a reason to go out and engage with the world. Now, as you do all of this, you can fast travel a bit, either with a street surfer or a taxi. Taxis are just traditional fast travel, really, whereas a street surfer is like a little Segway you can ride around that has a battery charge you have to watch out for, but it is customizable, which was kind of neat and it even has an autopilot mode, which I thought was pretty cool. But from there, let's talk about the two big mini games before we dive into dungeons. So first up, we have Dondoko Island. This is an island resort that opens up to you through the story that you can fix up and upgrade to basically earn money off of. Initially, when you get there, the place is trashed, quite literally. It's being used as a dump by a group of pirates of sorts that are actually like a small waste management company. And you have to clean up the island, fight these guys off, all while attending to your guests and the like. And after a little while, you'll be able to start crafting and building all sorts of structures to make this resort more interesting. And you can even customize the layout of individual areas as you start to clear them off. And there's all sorts of passives you can get going from this. And you can earn a lot of money from this. In fact, when I first encountered Dondoko Island, I decided to take about the roughly 10 hours it wound up taking to completely max it out right as I encountered it, and doing so kind of broke the game's economy for me. I actually wound up with a ton of cash to spend on all sorts of things like upgrades, etc. So this is a very good way to earn money while also engaging in a really fun mini game that sees you catering to all sorts of resort guests. There's even a customizable player home available on this island resort. So there's a lot to engage with here, but I think probably the best thing that comes from this is the skill you get from completing the story here called the Essence of Dondoko Beam, which is a very high cost ability that hits every enemy for very high damage. Overall though, really cool minigame. I don't think they cut any corners on this thing. This is like a proper little sim management and I enjoyed it quite a bit. It has very large benefits for the main game and while It can feel like a strange departure from the rest of it. It's pretty par for the course for the series, I would say. But then we have an even stranger one with Sujimon. Again, a short ways into the story, we'll be introduced through a certain NPC to Sujimon, or creeps and weirdos. That is to say, the very strange individuals we'll find out on the street can sometimes be convinced to join our team of Sujimon. That is to say, a Pokemon knockoff where we will take just regular old people, really, and convince them to fight and street fights with us to see who is the better Sujimon trainer. 
And like any good Pokemon knockoff, this involves training these characters up, usually through a mix of items and actual battles, of course. There's type matchups. It's also possible to catch these guys occasionally after battles, which actually just involves giving them gifts and then begging them to help you. And throughout the open world, there's little spots on the map you can go to to get items specifically for this minigame, and you can also earn tickets to allow you to do sort of gotcha pulls for extra Sujimon to use on your team and it's a very, very bizarre little game, and it has its own full-blown story tied to it with a knockoff Elite Four that they call the Discrete Four and everything. Very humorous, again, just one of those portions of the game that makes the entire thing feel like a fever dream. Now, another big piece of content I want to talk about before we move on are the dungeons. The dungeons are procedurally generated layouts that you can engage in fights, find a specific resource for each dungeon that allows you to purchase things like progression tokens for certain jobs, items that allow you to craft the best weapons, etc. There are three of these in total if you have the DLC, otherwise there is one for each area of the game, Hawaii and Japan. They have multiple floors to them, each with their own level, but the Hawaiian Haunt is the easiest one. It caps out at level 50, the Japan one caps out at level 55 in the base game that is, of course, and then the big swell, the DLC one, goes from level 55 to level 65. And while these are great areas to grind out levels and items from, they're really boring in every other way. So first of all, Hawaiian Haunt and Yokohama Underground in Japan all look the same. Every floor is basically just these corridors with the occasional room that either has enemies or items in it. There's only a couple of different things and each floor is a procedurally generated little layout, and it offers nothing of interest content-wise besides just running through it and killing things as fast as possible for XP or items. There's a boss fight at the end of it and a small story attached to each one, but they're not particularly interesting, and the DLC one is exactly the same besides a different texture, I would say, for the walls and rooms. So it looks a tiny bit different, but plays exactly the same. So while these are, I would say, useful for progression, especially for fighting enemies when you want to know exactly what level they are so you can grind out specific experience and levels and things like that, from a gameplay perspective, I just wish they'd done more with them because they are very boring to run through and it is exactly what it sounds like, a grind for levels and items. But all of that finally brings us to the combat section. Now combat in this game, I think, is, for the base game, really well done. It is a turn-based system but it is very quick, where things like positioning, which you are free to move around within a circle on, items that you'll find in the background, where you're hitting enemies even, can matter quite a bit, and I think that is fun. But I think it does fall apart after like level 50 for sure, possibly even a little bit before that, when every fight just devolves into blasting enemies with high-powered abilities that they melt to instantly. But to begin with, on your turn, your character can move within the blue circle around that character. As you level up, this actually increases in size so you'll be able to move farther and position yourself better because positioning matters. You can either get close to items and pick them up off the ground to use them against enemies, which can all have their own various effects or even hit multiple enemies at once, or hitting an enemy in the back will deal increased damage and ignore guard if they have it. Enemies can use a function called guard, so can you, which halves incoming damage but can be broken with skill and abilities that have a grapple effect. Combine that with skills that have their own area of effect, meaning that again, positioning is important, and a lot of the early game sees you messing around with those mechanics to utilize them in the best way possible to keep your team alive while fighting off enemies, and it's genuinely pretty fun. So on your turn, it's basically either attack, use a skill, use items, either choose to guard, or potentially swap out to an extra teammate, though that mostly becomes a thing in the late game, as through most of the regular game, you only have enough companions companions for one specific party with maybe one other character. But then we enter the summons. A bit into the story, I believe it's chapter 3 off the top of my head, you'll get access to the summoning, or pound mates as it's called, where you essentially dial up a service that then sends someone to help you in combat. As you complete side quests, etc., the people you can call to help you increases, and they come in three different tiers. I would say one, two, and three, all of which cost a different amount of cash to summon. Initially, tier one is pretty good, but it costs your turn to use. A little ways into the game, that one's going to become outdated, though, and you're primarily going to be using tier two and tier three. Tier two and tier three do not cost you a turn to activate, but they cost more money. Tier three will be expensive forever. However, 
tier two eventually becomes, I would say, incredibly overpowered. And this is because it costs an amount of money that is a lot at first, but in the late game is insignificant. You'll actually earn more money from the fights you use them in than it costs to use them. And because it doesn't cost you a turn to activate them, it's essentially free damage at that point. It even has chances to cause status effects, and the damage of that stays relevant all the way to the end of the game, basically. And that, combined with the other problems, where once you start reaching the max job ranks for the first time and you get these really high-powered abilities, you'll just be spamming these skills and these summons, which is going to melt enemies before they have a chance to hit you in most cases. So the combat, which starts off with all this fun positioning and items and just skills and things to break guards, etc., just all falls apart around level 50 towards the end of the game, which only gets worse in New Game Plus, which doesn't keep up with the progression curve at all. And that's to say nothing of all the jobs and the ways those mix up your party and how you can create a very specific combination of all these characters. And that's fun, again, at the beginning of the game, but just falls apart completely towards the end. Which, consequently, somewhat leads me to finally talk about the DLC. This game launched with a day one DLC called the Master Vacation Bundle that includes New Game Plus, an extra dungeon, as well as several additions to the Sujimon and Dondoko Island minigames. I made a separate video talking about how much I disliked this because at face value, New Game Plus behind a paywall is unfortunate. It's normally just an included feature. The bundle with this DLC is 85 and standalone, the DLC is 20 bucks, which again, I had to pay for myself. Now, for the most part, most people are not going to play New Game Plus, just period. That is a fact. Just is what it is. But in this case, New Game Plus comes in normal, hard, or legendary mode. Hard and legendary mode increase the levels of the game, but don't do anything else. They don't change the amount of gear available to you. It's still just the one through seven star system. It doesn't fundamentally change anything else in terms of combat, so it's just running through the game again at a higher level, and the enemies don't keep up with the progression curve at all, which just bleeds further into the problem I just mentioned about late game combat being a mess. The content that comes with the DLC is an extra dungeon called the Big Swell that we've talked a bit about already that is supposed to have a story attached to it. This is just a handful of cutscenes that don't have much to do with anything and just give you a bunch of extra bond experience with all of your characters, including some scenes where most of them that didn't have a chance to talk throughout the main game, due to being either in Japan or Hawaii, have a chance to interact. I wasn't impressed by it, especially for the DLC's price, and I can't help but feel like they put a paywall in between you and the worst content this game has to offer, which on the bright side makes it a very easy DLC to pass by because it is quite frankly not a good DLC. It adds nothing of value and highlights the worst aspect of the game. And reality is, unless you're someone like me who is reviewing this game specifically after dealing with all the content, including the new game plus achievements that were added for this DLC, etc., there's just no reason to buy this ever. This DLC is a blatant and cash grab in basically every way and offers nothing of value. Which brings me to the Steam Deck section for this review. The Steam Deck is an interesting case for this game. It officially has a verified rating, which I would say kind of makes sense to me, but I have two things of note to mention. One, the game has cloud saves and controller support, which is a big deal, but the cloud saves in particular, I could only ever get it to transfer my latest save between PC and the Steam Deck, so not sure if that's intentional or not, but for someone like myself who likes to parse through a bunch of save files, can be a little annoying. I doubt it's going to be that big a deal to most people, but I thought it was worth mentioning. And then the other thing I think is more substantial, and that is that the open areas you can run around, I had an impossible time getting a good frame rate for. Even on the game's lowest settings, it was very choppy, but the turn-based battles were perfectly fine. Didn't really have any FPS issues there. It was very playable. So when it comes to Steam Deck, I mean, could you play it? Yes, as long as you don't mind choppy frame rates while you're doing the open world running around part on the game's lowest graphical settings. So possible, but for me, I would much rather play this on PC or even a console, honestly, compared to the Steam Deck experience just because of how much the game struggles with the open world areas. But yes, technically it is very playable. That, though, brings me to my positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this one up. So on the 
positive side of things, I think just about everything for the base game is a ton of fun. I think the combat is great until you start getting towards the later levels at the end of your first run. I think there's a bunch of different activities to get up to out in the open world, a handful of really great side quests, the story is well written, and while I could nitpick a couple tiny things, like honestly some of the facial animations for unimportant characters are genuinely terrible and compared to the main cast where a lot of effort was put in, there's a big difference. But, you know, things like that are nitpicks. Really the only substantial negative I have for the base game is that once you start reaching the in-game combat, it just falls apart. I went from having a blast with combat, it being pretty engaging and fast-paced, to it just being a tedious slog where I was just hitting the same buttons over and over again, getting through it as quickly as possible. And for the base game, I think that's fine. You just got all these abilities. You likely want to play around with them, and you're likely at the end game by the time that happens anyways. And then the other big negative is, of course, the situation with the DLC. Day one DLC is already a pretty annoying thing in and of itself, but then we have a basic game feature locked behind a paywall. The DLC it is locked behind with actively highlights the worst aspects of this game, such as the, I would say, copy and paste dungeons that add very little in terms of gameplay value, which is really unfortunate to see. Which leads me to my conclusion for this game. Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth has a fantastic base game. The base game is absolutely worth the 70 bucks they're asking for. It was a ton of fun. I had a hard time putting it down once I got invested into it after a few slow opening hours, which is a big reason you're getting this review. I wasn't originally planning on touching it. But then you have the DLC, which highlights exactly where this game starts to come apart at the seams a bit, which is the late game post, I would say, level 50 combat system and the many other things we've gotten into already. Ready. Which means as far as recommendations go, it's pretty easy. The base game is fun and worth it, the DLC sucks and is not. So if that DLC is important to you, or you really want to play New Game Plus, I would say wait a little while for the sale to go down, so it's all with the same price, basically. But if you're the type of person, I would say most people, realistically, who don't care about New Game Plus, then yeah, absolutely. Buy the base game, it's a ton of fun. And was, honestly, a nice way to kick off 2024, as it'll be a few months yet before I would say the really big releases start dropping. So this was a nice, I would say, palette cleanser for the games I had been playing up to this point. But that is pretty much going to do it for this video. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about it down in the comment section below. I'd love to know what you think about this particular title, which of course means to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.